Hello, I'm Noel Chair and welcome to Capital Talk. Tonight's programme is different in two respects. The first is my guest is not a politician, at least not in the generally accepted sense of the word. The second is that this programme is pre-recorded in Christchurch because my guest is doing a quick trip to New Zealand and he doesn't plan to visit Wellington. We're grateful to Canterbury Television for lending us their studio and their staff so that we can pre-record this programme. Tonight, I'm in conversation with Stephen Batchelor. Stephen is from Britain, he's Scottish by birth, and he is a Buddhist who some years ago spent 10 years as a Buddhist monk. Today, he advocates changes to the understanding and practice of Buddhism. What he has to say sheds some interesting light not only on where religious expression and practice in general is going, but where the West itself is heading. Welcome, Stephen. Welcome to Capital Talk. Welcome to Canterbury. There are plenty of people wanting to reform Christianity. I met Stephen at a conference where that subject was being dealt with. But one doesn't often meet a reforming critic of Buddhism. Four years ago, Stephen summed up his case in the book, Buddhism Without Beliefs. It's a good read. But first, Buddhism as it understands and presents itself. The person who later became known as the Buddha was a prince who suddenly had reality thrust in his face. Is that how it all started? Yes, I think we can think of the Buddha as, in a way, an ordinary man like ourselves. There's no sense in Buddhism that the Buddha was a, a son of a god or a manifestation of a god, but he was an ordinary person who suddenly had to come to terms or found himself coming to terms with the primary condition of what it means to be human. So it wasn't just that his princely status had isolated him from this, it was more fundamental than that. Well, I think the princely status is certainly uh, a factor because it symbolizes, as it were, the conventional life in which many people live, a life of privilege in which one is somehow protected by all manner of mm. devices from mm. the encounter with, say, for example, sickness and aging and death, the great questions that drive our lives. So we're supposed to say the Buddha, not Buddha. Buddha is not his name. His name is Siddhartha Gautama, mm. and he became... Buddha. And Buddha means uh, the awakened one, the mm -hmm. one who woke up. Mm -hmm. So people sometimes so use the word enlightenment. It's not enlightenment? Yes. Enlightenment is a term one could use, but the, the Buddha's experience is called in Sanskrit bodhi, which literally means awakening. Mm -hmm. There's no s sense in that of some kind of light having been shed, although of course that's a perfectly adequate metaphor. Mm -hmm. But I think the idea of waking up suggests that previously he had found himself in a kind of maybe a dreamlike state yeah. or a, a kind of unconscious state from which he suddenly kind of saw things in a new way. Okay. So many, many in the West see some common sense in the Four Noble Truths of mm -hmm. Buddhism and they seem, to me anyway, to net down to we suffer because we have hang-ups, get rid of the hang-ups and the suffering stops. Is that a fair summary or is that too glib? Well it's a little bit <laughs> so. I, I, glib I don't know but the, the, the basic thing that the Buddha wanted to point out to us was the extent to which we, life is shot through with, one might say, dissatisfaction, with pain. Mm -hmm. We often try to kind of deny that. We mm -hmm. feel that if only we could just sort ourselves out a little bit better, get the right kind of job, mm -hmm. the right kind of partner, then everything would be fine. Mm -hmm. But of course reality shows us that no matter what we gain, mm -hmm. it might have a, we might have a wonderful place to live, a wonderful job, wonderful family, yeah. and yet there's still something within us that gnaws away and says, well, you know, is that all? Yeah. And, and of course it, yeah. then there's ageing, there's yeah. death, which are things which, you know, we So is this what, what's called in English anguish, or what is called in Sanskrit dukkha? Dukkha. Uh, yeah. Well, this term dukkha I translate as anguish, yeah. but that is really to try to emphasize that the suffering that the Buddha speaks of is really an a suffering about the nature of our existence. Mm. It's a sort of deep-seated feeling that we're not somehow fulfilled. Mm. So it's an complete. existential anguish rather yes. than, a, than, than pain in the normal acceptance. No, absolutely. Yeah. I feel that Buddha's um, uh, path is really that of recognizing this primary condition of anguish, the feeling we have when we become aware that we've been thrown into this world yes. without choice. Mm that we are subject to all of the vagaries and the misfortunes that life can bring us. Yep. And that ultimately we will be evicted from this world. Mm -hmm. And to pay attention to that, to notice that, yep. evokes 
probably for most so of us, a sense of To optimize our time while we're here, that's that sort of thing. To Sorry, op to, to optimize the human condition, to optimize. That's how I would understand mm. it. I think we tend to live in a kind of dream, mm. a, 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 a fictitious world mm. that we we dream that things could be fine and perfect and yeah. better, and yet. In doing so, we're somehow denying the very nature of the human condition. Mm. Uh, Buddhism often seems to me a bit like psychotherapy, and not much like a religion in the sense that the West understands the term. Was the Buddha intent on setting up a sort of non-religion, a counter to religion, an antidote? Well, arguably, the very term religion was not really utilized at his time. He, he speaks of, of, of teaching the Dharma, and the Dharma means something like the law, the way things are, a way of life, I think, would be much better. Certainly, it's very useful to think of Buddhism as akin, perhaps, to psychotherapy. The Buddha spoke of himself as a healer. Mm -hmm. He didn't speak of himself as a, as a god or a teacher so mm -hmm. much, but as someone who, as it were, had found a way to heal the human condition. And mm -hmm. his teaching, his dharma, was a methodology. Mm -hmm. And in that case, again, like a therapy, mm. a methodology that, if put into practice, could achieve a healing, not just in a mm. superficial level, yeah. getting rid of one's worries and so sure. on, but actually somehow addressing that primary anguish, that primary pain of being human. Mm. Some of the, uh, this, this motif of getting rid of uh, hang-ups or anguish or whatever mm. seem to have spilled over into Western New Age kind of expressions mm -hmm. of things. Is that a degradation of Buddhism, some of these manifestations? Well, I think the interesting thing to notice is that each time Buddhism has encountered a new culture, mm. and at the moment it's encountering modern, contemporary Western culture, it's picked up in a whole range of different ways. Mm. It's been picked up very much in the world of psychotherapy and psychology. Certain philosophers have taken on board some of its ideas. And also what we loosely call New Age, mm. an idea of of personal fulfillment of practice, a kind of rejection of conventional religion perhaps. Yeah. All of these movements seem to find some connection, some yeah. point of commonality uh, within yeah. Buddhism. Um, now, I think it's fairly obvious from what you've already said that Buddhists wouldn't worship the Buddha. That would be quite inappropriate in the way perhaps <laughs> that Christians worship Christ. Or are there differences among Buddhists as to the, the, the divine or mm -hmm. otherwise status of the Buddha? Yeah, the, the different Buddhist schools have very different perceptions and relations to the Buddha. I think it is true, though, to say that as a Buddhist, one does, in a way, worship the Buddha, not in a kind of blind adulation, mm. but rather a recognition that here is a person, perhaps, is the ultimate role model. Mm -hmm. Here is a person who has achieved a degree of insight, yeah. a degree of compassion, a degree of authenticity, yeah. perhaps, that why one could perhaps aspire to oneself. And so in that, that yeah. sense, there's a worship is perhaps a little too religious mm. to my taste, mm. but nonetheless, I think that is an appropriate response, mm. and many Buddhists would. Okay. would well, Buddhism would talks that. a lot about inner peace, about achieving yes. inner peace. But in the Jewish tradition and the offspring mm -hmm. the, from the Jewish tradition, Christianity and Islam, they're much more inclined to talk about spending one's life in the sense that some anguish on the way is not only expected, but somehow enriches life by having to meet yes. the anguish and deal with it. Well, you find that very idea in Buddhism too. I mean, the, the Buddhism is characterized sometimes as a religion that leads to a sort of inner peace, a kind of mystical stillness, mm. Uh, mm. It, and always in a highly privatized mm. sort of way. But I think that's rather too simplistic. Mm. The Buddha's first injunction was actually to acknowledge the nature of pain. And that is not in itself something that's going to bring one in a peace. If anything, mm. it might actually trigger a turmoil okay. within oneself, which is seen as crucial to the actual pursuit. So the aspiration the for inner peace is not, not necessarily going to get you there. The, the, oh, no. No, no, no. no. The, the <laughs> just by wanting inner peace is yeah. far from sufficient to actually gaining it. The Buddha speaks of a methodology, of a way of actually leading one's life in all spheres of one's existence that, as it were, conspire or, let's say, move towards a greater sense of serenity and peacefulness. Okay. But that's not a peacefulness that is found by removing oneself from life, okay. but actually having the courage to go deep into deep, its deep, heart. Okay. Yeah. There are some uh, that things that were in the air when Buddhism started, uh, existing ideas, like reincarnation. How can we tell what's essential to Buddhism and what can be safely discarded and ignored as being historical yes. accretions or historical accidents? Well, I think we need to bring to our reflection on Buddhism a far greater historical awareness and an awareness of 
what was, as it were, part of the culture of, say, the Buddha's time, and to then be able to slowly differentiate elements that are crucial to, to the Buddha's teaching yep. as opposed to those elements that are actually simply the common currency of Indian thought and philosophy. The, the, there are now various debates going on in the Christian world as to what elements of Christianity mm -hmm. are optional and yes. what, are, what are important elements. Um, and, and is that going on in Buddhism as well? And I, you, I know you're one of them. Mm -hmm. Are others like yourself? I think for many Westerners, in other words, people who are not brought up in a traditional Buddhist society, there's often a sense of this is not quite fitting. We have, for example, ideas in Buddhism like a letting go of an attachment to self, attachment mm. to ego, and yet at the same time there's a sense that yourself will be reborn in some other realm. Uh -huh. This doesn't seem to quite fit. No, and so the, the reincarnation thing was obviously part of the Hindu practices yes. at the time. Mm -hmm. And do, are you suggesting the Buddha perhaps uncritically picked up reincarnation mm -hmm. and perhaps forgot to put it down or something? Well, it could simply be that this was the accepted worldview of his time mm. and he saw that belief to actually not be incompatible with his basic teaching. Mm. He was primarily concerned to offer people a way to achieve freedom. Mm. In other words, it's a liberative practice. Yes. And that liberative practice operates within a moral framework and that moral framework in India, which was, was one very much tied in about doing good works now such that right. you will achieve a, uh, some positive results after death. Yes. He didn't see any need to dispense with that. Oh, right. So, um, it's, it's part of this, this karma thing, is it, that, that as you sow, so shall you reap, mm -hmm. was, was yes. reincarnation then in the air in order to make that work after death, even after death? Essentially, yes. Reincarnation provides a kind of vehicle whereby the, the, um, the act that one commits can, as it were, be held in, in abeyance, as it were, until the time comes for them to ripen. Yeah. Uh, karma and rebirth are often spoken in, the, in yeah. the same phrase, as though they're completely necessary. I don't feel that to be the case. So a modern Buddhist, as, uh, like yourself, wouldn't, wouldn't need it. So what other mechanism do we have for, um, for, for justice, for moral justice in, in the world? And well, you see, I think the Buddhist teaching on karma is a very precise one and a very clear one and it can operate just as well without the theory of reincarnation. Oh, okay. right. In other words, it's a recognition that every act, every moral act that we commit mm. will have repercussions. Yes. It will have repercussions in our own inner psychological life. We'll feel guilt perhaps or we'll feel shame mm. or we'll feel um, justice or whatever. And also, of course, it has implications on the lives of those with whom we live, mm -hmm. both those close to us as well as the society. Well, as hold that thought. We need to go to a break at the stage. Oh, okay. And when we come back from the break, we're going to ask Stephen about his 10 years as a Buddhist monk. Come back soon.